Um, let's open our Bibles again to the message that uh, I did not finish last week and see if in the Lord's kindness we might uh, finish it this week. Let me uh, just begin and pray myself. Lord, I'm not under any um, illusion that I am uh, smart enough or eloquent enough or experienced enough to cause uh, these dry bones to become alive. But I pray that by your spirit you would move through your word. I pray that uh, men and women would take the burdens that they carry so heavily upon their hearts and they would grieve their prayerlessness and leave it behind them and seek you in your grace and mercy in a fresh new way. We are praying and believing for significant breakthroughs in prayer in our life in our families, in our churches. So help us now as your word goes forth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. James 5, James 5, verse 13. We got about halfway through it. Um, let me read it again. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. I pointed out to you last week the difference between narrative scripture and uh, epistle. In the story portions of scripture, we, we're being told what happened, but we're not being told necessarily that it's awesome. We have to compare scripture with scripture, but when we get concentrated instruction in God's word, then we need to look that much more closely because this is the Holy Spirit telling us what God wants us to know about prayer. Now, James chapter 5 verse 13 is the most concentrated instruction on prayer in the entire New Testament. If you're serious about your Christian life, if you're serious about this matter of prayer, James 5 is a passage that you should be mastering, if not memorizing. And it does not yield its entire meaning easily, but when you grasp what it's really saying, it's very, very impactful. I've called this message, What to Pray About. This is What to Pray About, part two. Let's just review quickly uh, where we were last week. Here's the first thing, and I hope you've been doing this, what to pray about. Do this. Pray for emotional health. Some of the greatest ailments of our day are emotional ailments. Fear and insecurity and worry and anxiousness and all of these things and how they translate down into physical ailments. James 5.13 says, is anyone among you suffering? And we learned last time that that's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. I'll ask the question. You give the answer. Ready? Is anyone among you suffering? Yes. Is anyone among you suffering? Yes. You think about our church. Are there not many people across our seven campuses who are right now going through the hardest time in their life? Are they not? Yes, they are. I can tell you that this word here, suffering, kakapatheo, actually refers to enduring evil treatment by people, most specifically. That's the whole theme of James. It starts in chapter 1 where he talks about these 12 tribes, the sons of Jacob, the nation of Israel, who had been dispersed across Asia Minor because of the persecution in uh, the Holy Land. And so they were enduring evil treatment by people. Now, I can tell you, personally, that if you don't take the things that have happened to you at the hands of other people, if you don't take that to God in prayer, that's going to ruin you. That's going to completely ruin you. If you've ever met a person in there, forgive me, I'll pick a decade I haven't quite reached yet. If you've ever met a person in their 60s or 70s or 80s who is kind of angry and critical and negative and be, be sure of it. Things happen to them and 
they didn't take it to God in prayer. Instead of getting better, they got bitter. Um, but let me say this a better way. You get better or you get bitter depending upon your choice about prayer. Now look at I'm not off topic here, okay? Love you. Every person, the ones I can see and the ones I can't see and the ones that'll watch this on television someday, every person hearing this is living this life. Either you're getting better or you're getting bitter. And if you're feeling the struggle at times as I am, get to prayer. Get to prayer. Had an awesome prayer time today on this point. And yesterday would have been better had I had it then too. Either you're kneeling to give it to God or it's gnawing away at your insides. One of those two. How many cancers and high blood pressures and kidney diseases and colon dysfunction and unresolved emotional stress. How much of it is flowing from this? We don't pray as we ought to. We don't pray as we ought to. Notice that it's the broadest range of emotional health because he goes right to, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. That's God's answer. There it is. And is anyone cheerful? The idea there is just a, an inner elation, a positive, hopeful outlook. And the same thing is true as anyone cheerful. Some people have had an awesome week. I hope it's been you. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. In the peak and in the... That's prayer too. In the peak and in the valley. When the sun is shining and when the clouds are dark. On top of the world and in the depth of despair. Pray, 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 pray. Just that. And that's where the emotional health is found. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're fearing about the future, God's provision for you in that is found in prayer and praying rightly. I love this sentence. I've said it before. It's not original with me, but it so resonates that we... Your health is less about uh, what you eat and more about what eats you. Right? It's not what, what you eat. That's awesome. Awesome. That's important. I'm not, please don't write to me and tell me I said that wasn't important. Turn to your neighbor and say, what you eat is important. <laughs> but it might be that what eats you is the most important thing. And prayer is God's provision for that. We judge God harshly as the harsh realities of life begin to weigh us down when we should be looking at our prayer journals. Why is it that you don't seem to be able to carry that? Or maybe a better way to ask it is, why is it that I don't seem to be able to carry what she can carry, what he can carry? Well, what about my prayer life? All of that review, really, um, pray for emotional health, and then this, I uh, pray for physical health. Is anyone among you sick? Is anyone among you sick? This is the New Testament model for healing right here, and I'm, this is going to be a great spot for an amen coming up. And God does heal. Amen. Come on now, and God does heal. Amen. We believe that God heals. And, and I don't believe that God heals necessarily uh, on demand, but I believe with all my heart our own son was healed. We've seen many healings in our church. This is the New Testament model for healing. Is anyone among you sick? Again, rhetorical. Let him call. So you, you, the person who's sick does the calling. The elders don't go door to door looking for people to anoint with oil. The sick person has faith, and they know the word of God. Someone listening to me right now is going to get something from the doctor in the next few months, no doubt it would have to be statistically true. And what will you do right then? Will you remember James 5? Will you call for the elders of the church? Will you let them come to your home and anoint you with oil and pray? 
Because it says here, let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save, often used of physical healing in the New Testament, will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, implying obviously a total healing, health and strength. And if he's committed sins, now that's a funny phrase, if he's committed sins, if, 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 no, all have sinned. If anyone says he has no sin, the truth's not in him. It's not talking about generic run of the mill, we've all sinned. Come on, lift up your voice, say we've all sinned. We've all sinned. It's not talking about that. It's talking about if he's committed any sins that are the source of his sickness. And so be very appropriate for the elders who have come to pray over you and anoint you with oil. Be very um, appropriate for them to ask you in privacy and in confidentiality, is there any besetting sin, any long-term pattern of sin, any unconfessed sin that the Lord may have allowed this sickness to come into your... We're not saying that it's because of that. Some sickness is for the glory of God. Some sickness, we don't know why. But this has to get addressed so that it can get confessed, which leads to the broadest category here, which is Pray for physical health, pray for emotional health, pray for physical health. How much more healing could we see in the church if we took this incredible invitation seriously? Did you know that 80 to 85% of all churches in North America have plateaued or are in, de in decline? Did you know that all across our country, churches are boarded up and up for sale? Long before churches go up for sale, congregations, including their pastor, have failed in the matter of prayer. God is not reluctant. God is not unwilling. We have not because we ask not or because we ask wrongly, as we've studied in the weeks gone by. Long before pews are empty, eyes are dry, and prayers are cold, and hearts are hard, and first love is gone, and healing doesn't happen, and nothing's happening at all, and people stop attending. Trace that back to its source. Don't you want to see great and mighty things that you've not known? This is our watch, loved ones. This is our opportunity. We didn't live in the 1800s. We're not going to live in the 2100s. This is our day. This is our time to pray and to call out to God and see Him do mighty things. We are a people of prayer. This is one of the pillars that holds up our church. Four pillars, four corners. One pillar down, the roof falls in. We are a people of prayer. Pray for emotional health. Pray for physical health. And pray for spiritual health. Notice, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The word therefore, or because sin can be a blockage to answered prayer, physically and emotionally, because the reason that my prayers might not be answered is because of pride or stubbornness or indolence, I'm to confess that, homilageo, Say the same thing. Agree with God. Verbalize agreement. Here's my confession script. Will you join me in it? I sinned. I have no excuse. Nothing that anyone else did in any way justifies my sin. I'm wrong. I'm sorry for, and name it, I have no excuse. Please forgive me. Now I'm going to tell you there's power in those words. And it isn't easy. Leave it up. It isn't easy to get to the place where you can say and mean it. Nothing that anyone else did in any way 
justifies what I have done. I'm wrong. I have no excuse. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now, the person who can say that to God and to others where appropriate is lighting their prayer life on fire. And that's why it says, therefore confess your sins. But the confusing part is the to one another. Some of our men at least know that this is the subject of my doctoral dissertation, James 5.16. So I've probably studied this verse more than any other verse in the Bible. Um, the confessing of your sin to one another here has led to some false doctrine. And particularly the idea of what's called auricular confession. Auricular confession means into the ear. And we, we do not believe in confessing our sins to one another for the purpose of forgiveness. In multiple places, the scripture says only God can forgive sins. So we don't confess our sins to one another for forgiveness. But listen, but we cannot dismiss James 5.16, which says confess your sins to one another. Come on, say that little scriptural phrase with me. Come on, confess your sins to one another. Say it again. Now, are we a Bible church? Does it say confess your sins to one another? Are we supposed to do that? We are. So, so then the question is, well, why? If not for the forgiveness of sins, and this is what my uh, dissertation was all about, we don't confess our sins to one another for forgiveness. We confess our sins to one another for assurance of forgiveness. For assurance of forgiveness. And so many Christians struggle with Assurance of forgiveness. Remember before you were saved, you could swear like a sailor and drink like a fish and run around and sleep around and fool around till sun up and never think about it again. Some of you are like, well, I didn't do one of those things. Okay, well, fine, that's not my point. My point is, my point is, is that before you were saved, you could do whatever you want and you never felt any guilt or anything about it at all. Hands up if that was true for you. All right? So, but then you get saved. And I mean, the lady gives you too much change at the grocery store and you're in tears by the parking lot and you got to go back and give it back to her. <laughs> and your heart's so tender and sensitive about everything. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Is it still like that for you? Maybe you need another believer to assure you of God's forgiveness. And not just confess your sins to one another, but what's the next part? then pray for one another. Pray for one another. Why? And pray for one another that you may be healed. I think he's talking still about physical healness, uh, healing, but I think beyond that, he's moved to spiritual health. And I think we would all agree that we need, we need the Lord's healing at every level, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and he promises all of that to us according to his will. So... Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then this, what to pray for. Pray for emotional health, pray for physical health, pray for spiritual health. I mean, I, I really don't know what to call verse 16. Um, let's just call that pray for results. Pray for specific results. This is such a great verse. The rest of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Some translations under as it is working have effective. Uh, the Greek word there is, is energetic, energeo. It's like it's, 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 it's moving, it's churning, it's turning, it's burning, it's impacting. Notice, has great power. Literally, that means is very strong. Energetic praying is very strong. But wait, there's a qualifier. Energetic praying has great power. Here it is. From a righteous person. Now that's kind of a catch-22, isn't it? Because if you're like, well, my prayer is going to go pretty awesome because I'm a righteous person. But then you're prideful, so oops, lost it. <laughs> it's kind of like, how do I get out of this box, okay? So here's how you get out of it. Ready? 
A few weeks ago, I, I preached on the story in Luke 18 where two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Remember? And the, the Pharisee stood and said within himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And, and, and I'm not like this. And remember, he looked kind, kind of down his nose. I'm not like this tax collector. And, and Jesus said that, so then the other guy kind of walks in the back door and, and it says that the tax collector would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat upon his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus, having told that story, said, I'm telling you, that guy went down to his house justified rather than the other. The word justified means to be declared and treated as righteous. Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the word justified. Romans 4 says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And if you've turned from your sin and embraced Jesus Christ by faith, if you've been saved, you have the imputed righteousness of Christ. You're not righteous. You're not. And if you think, think you are, that's kind of a pretty crushing blow to your prayer life. But if you know that I actually am so grateful to be under God's grace and mercy and I have applied to my life through Christ's merits. I have the imputed righteousness of Christ, what Paul talked about in Philippians 3 when he said that I might be found in him not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in him. And so through faith in Christ, we are that person. In fact, make a note of this, because we are in Christ, our energetic prayers are very powerful. Now, you start to think about that. A lot of people would have opted out of the prayer thing. Well, I'm not righteous, but I just told you. If you're born again, you have the righteousness of Christ. Do you understand that? Do you understand what a powerful prayer tool you are? And every time you get ready to go to prayer, the enemy's like, I saw what you were thinking. I saw how you acted. I saw what you... And he tries to tell you that your practical righteousness is not adequate to prayer, to which you should simply reply, I couldn't agree more. So I'll begin my prayer with confession and adoration and thanksgiving so that when it comes time for me to really seek the Lord about the things that are on my heart, the righteousness of Christ will be mine. And even if I'm not the wife that I wanted to be today and even if I'm not the parent that I wanted to be and even if I wasn't the way I had planned to be at work, tomorrow's a new day and I have the righteousness of Christ and I'm not going to let the enemy grind me under his heel or keep me from the place of prayer because I feel inadequate on my own. How many people feel inadequate on their own? And yet God throws out this, come boldly before the throne of grace and we're like, eh, eh, you know, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And, and that guy was justified but he needed some better teaching because he didn't need to stand at the back of the church but Jesus himself said he is welcomed he is welcomed to the throne of grace and I want to hear from that person who knows that their righteousness is of me not of themselves so we can pray for results start praying for something to happen start praying for something to happen Pray this week for something to happen. You know what your breakthrough prayers have been. I've got seven of them. I've been over them and over them and over them and over them. Pray for something to happen. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. It's been working on me. The things that I wrote down 30 days ago and more were of the greatest urgency to me, and they still are, but I find myself mostly able to be more content with where things are than I was before I was praying as I'm praying now. Anybody with me on that? I found that I'm able to just, all right, Lord, having given it to you so frequently and so fervently, I am left no doubt about to whom it belongs and to whom I'm looking and where my help comes from. Pray for a door to open or to close. Pray for a heart to soften. 
Pray for a contact to come. Pray for daily bread, for sufficient grace, for increased faith. I also love the quote, also not original with me. We pray for easier paths when we ought to pray for stronger shoes. And where you're praying most for God to change something that is causing you pain. Mightn't you also pray this week that God would increase your capacity to live with it as it is until he changes it? Well, I don't, I don't even want to think for a moment that, that it's not going to change. Well, but hasn't there been enough time for you to know now that God's not on your timetable? And sometimes the answer tarries, as I've said so frequently, because God's making me spiritually fit to receive what he's already willing to do. And so maybe what's really going on is until some of these things are settled in me, God's not going to remove the pressure that was sent to produce that in me. And finally this, pray for your emotional and physical and spiritual health, pray for results. And then this little illustration. Pray for little steps and small confirmations. There's so much that I could say about verse 17 and 18. We could preach a whole series and someday no doubt will on Elijah. Elijah was one of the great Old Testament prophets. Do you see his name there as we begin verse 17? What do you know about Elijah? What if I were to give our, our church a quiz right now? How many things could you tell me about Elijah? Do you know where his story is in the Bible? First Kings? He's mentioned in other places, for example, at the transfiguration of Jesus, only two guys show up from the Old Testament, right? Who were they? David and Elijah, right? Nice, caught you. Moses and Elijah. Just want to see if you're with me. Moses and Elijah. Why? Because Moses rep represented the law and Elijah was considered the greatest of the prophets. And so there's the scriptures right there, the law and the prophets. And they showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. This guy's big time. He's in Hebrews 11 in the faith chapter. Look what we learn about him here. He's also in James 5. It's so shocking what we're going to hear here. Elijah was a man. Now, if you didn't know what the Bible said, you would say he was a man who was mighty in prayer. And he called down fire on Mount Carmel. I've been there to Mount Carmel. And, and uh, it's so awesome to see the valley and to think of the idolatry and the, you know, you know, let's do this right now. Come on. If God is God, then awesome. If he isn't, no problem. And he just throws down in front of all the false prophets and everything. You remember this whole story? Do you know what I'm talking about? Did you read this part? It's super awesome. You should read it today. Better than anything you're going to do after church for sure. <laughs> You should go read this. And, and so, you know, back and forth and back and forth. And, and they can't, these guys are cutting themselves and bleeding. Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. And all this stuff's going on and on and on. Nothing happens. Then Elijah takes all these big buckets of water, pours it on his sacrifice, drenches it, it says, till the water round down in the trenches and down this hillside. So there'd be no doubt that, oh, it was a spark. I think it might have been lightning. Yeah, no question about this. And then he prays a simple prayer. And God hears and fire comes down from heaven and... It's a, it's a mighty victory. I thought that would be the story that would make the Elijah headlines. So here's what's awesome, because you're about to get laid out. Turn to your neighbor and say, can you handle it? <laughs> Here it comes. Here it comes. Ready? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I mean, we look at a guy like Elijah, and we're like, dang, I wish, whatever he had, man, I wish I got some of that. Just tell me where to go get Elijah stuff. I'm going for it, right? Actually, Elijah was right after that big victory on Mount Carmel. He's hungry. He's afraid. He, he has a major bout with depression. Lord, help us to dispense once for all with the idea that, that people who live like that and pray like that are just a different stratosphere of people than regular folk like us. Come on, lift up your voice. Say, not so. Not so. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Moms, you can pray just like Elijah. 
Men, we can pray just like Elijah. People who are wrestling with infertility, people who are wanting and seeking and praying toward a lifetime partner, whatever the major presenting issue is in your life, from loneliness to despair, Elijah felt all of those things. And he prayed and God answered. And he was just like us. But what's really interesting to me here is the passage is referring to one specific incident. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And he prayed again, having gave rain. So this incident in his life has to do with uh, two people. They were the king and the queen. Do you know their names? Do you know their names? They stand in Old Testament infamy. Ahab and, come on, and Jezebel. You Jezebel. Yeah, there was a real one. And she was all that. Ahab and Jezebel. All right? And, and the, these, these people were such a thorn in the side of, of Elijah and his ministry. Now, it's interesting. We don't ever see Elijah praying, you know, get him, God. I mean, if he can call down fire from heaven, I mean, it shouldn't be too much to take out a couple of politicians, right? <laughs> get him, God. He never prayed like that. This prayer about the rain and the non-rain was to bring them to their knees, to bring them to humility. He played, he, listen to me, he prayed for a little step on a long journey toward what God ultimately wanted in the end. And I find that so instructive. And if some of your breakthrough prayers have been these big, rock the world, I want my sister to be saved. God wants that too. He's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance, and he delays. Don't you ever wonder why the Lord isn't back yet? He's giving people time. He's so merciful. He's giving us time. And as he's giving us time, we should be praying for little incremental, Lord, just help me to have a good conversation with my sister this week where she doesn't get angry and hang up. Just pray for a step along the way and let God link those steps together to your ultimate prayer being answered in his time. Pray for little steps. Pray for, God, am I crazy to keep praying for you about this? Could you just, and just pray for some little confirmation. Just seek the Lord. There just be, be a sign. And don't even specify to him what it needs to be. It's wicked to seek after a specific sign, but you could just pray, God, just show me something or indicate in some way or just witness even to my heart or through a friend that I'm not wrong to keep trusting you about this and show me and remind me that you're working. Pray like that. Great prayers come from people like us who choose to pursue God in fervent prayer. Well... I heard when I was in college the story of a man named Mordecai Ham, and I'm going to use him as an illustration of fervent prayer. He was born in 1877. He died the year I was born. Now, Mordecai Ham was not a perfect man by a long shot, but he was a passionate evangelist and preached the gospel in the southern United States, mostly by radio and in person at various events. And one time he was in Birmingham, true story. He was in Birmingham to preach the gospel, and um, he, I mean, that's a steel town, right? Birmingham, a lot of rough people, and, and he was the perfect evangelist for them. He was a pretty rough guy, and, and, uh, but they didn't like the way the pastors and the leaders of the convention didn't like the way that he was inviting people to come to Christ, and, and Ham would, would plead with people, and he would weep in front of people, and he would beg people to come to Christ. They didn't like it. And so they caught a little delegation together and they went over to his hotel and they went up and they knocked on the door and, you know, we, they went, we're going to go talk to him about this. And as they knocked on the door, the door swung open and there in the corner of the room was Mordecai Ham and uh, praying. And I mean praying. Praying for, the, praying for the 
lost in Birmingham, crying out to God for the salvation of these people who were without hope and without God and without Christ in the world. And he was so intent on being fervent that he had actually taken a chair in the hotel room and he was lifting it up over his head and sweat was pouring off him and he was saying, God, let me, as I feel the weight of this, God, let me feel the weight on your heart for these lost people. And the men heard him praying like that and they just kind of backed out of the room and they said, man, a man prays like that, he can invite people to Christ any way he wants to. <laughs> and, and such an awesome example, Mordecai Ham, I bet hardly a person here had ever heard of him, but he's also the man who preached the gospel when Billy Graham gave his heart to Christ. But what was behind all that? What was behind all of it that no one would have known about was this man who was passionate in prayer. And I want to be that man. And I want you to be those people.